talk gnosis for November. Uh, I wrote this down earlier. It's not there. For November 20, whatever it is, 2012. What day is it? It's Saturday. Saturday. It's for Saturday. Um, I'm Father Tony, and joining me again, sitting right next to me, Bishop Thomas Langley. Bishop, hello. Good to see you, Padre. Uh, yeah, so we uh, thought that tonight, we've been doing this for six months. We've been doing talk notes for about six months, and we've gotten some questions uh, from viewers in that time, and a lot of them we've answered in the comment section, or we've answered by email or on Facebook or, or various other sources, but we thought that it might be interesting to answer some of those questions again on the show for those people who don't uh, habitually read YouTube comments, which I suspect is almost everybody. Right. Um, so... We've got a couple of interesting questions, and uh, we'll jump right into it. Uh, one of the earliest questions we got from our, our lecture or our discussion on Valentinian cosmology was, you know, why do we even bother? Why do we talk about cosmology in the first place? I mean, is it is, is are these stories that we tell about the Gnostic creation mythos? Are did they actually happen? Uh, is the Big Bang invalid because of you know, it just, does science, is science wrong? Are we anti-science? I mean, that's a lot of things, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, you know, I um, I think a lot of us, when we first come to the, the, the Gnostic texts um, and related documents, there's a tendency for, and I guess this is when we approach any, any literature, it's this way, we, we sort of pick out the things that kind of make sense to us. And then uh, the things that are, that are foreign or new or have bizarre Greek Coptic names. <laughs> they sort of skim through it and say, well, that just, you know, and, and, and also, you know, coming from the culture that we do, and the, the, a day like today of, of real intellectual and spiritual decay and deterioration, um, we also just don't want to really learn new things or, or think that we have to learn new things in order to do spiritual work. And and yet the more the more that I've looked at the, um, the Gnostic text, I know you've you've talked about this a lot too. Um, the clearer it becomes that cosmology wasn't just wasn't just you know one important thing. It was one of the most important things to the Gnostics. And um, you know we're taught today in a, in a lot of places that well dogma is not important. Doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sort of you know. As long as you're nice and you drive a Prius, then um, it's important to be nice and, and probably to drive a Prius as well. But but if you ask the Gnostic over and over again, looking at the text, if you ask the Gnostic what was important, the first thing that they gave you was a cosmology. This mm -hmm. is how the world came into being, and these are the powers that shape it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their cosmology really defined their theology in, in a very real way. But yeah. talking about the fall of Sophia and talking about the Demiurge and the Archons. I mean, those things, um, whether you view them as, as literal realities or spiritual realities, for lack of a better right. term, I mean, that's a stupid term for it, but, you know, these things, these forces are actually real and present in the world, and they affect everything. Right, it, right, and, and one of the things that I've, um, I've come to see, at least personally, is that it's important to avoid, a, a, on one hand, the, um, the extreme of fundamentalism, mm -hmm. the temptation to take all this as some kind of literal happening. And on the other hand, the equally um, dangerous extreme, uh, the sort of the approach of secular humanism or liberal theology, which says, well, none of this really matters. It's all just, you know, let's examine it in its cultural context as literature, but it's not really spiritually efficacious. Right, what does this mean for our psyche? It, yeah, or, or, or yeah, yeah, psychological reductionism. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I always tell people I don't take it literally or figuratively, I take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Be and and, and that's, not to, that's not being glib because, like you said, the cosmology um, provides us a map, and, it, and it, it has tentacles that reach into every other aspect of our thinking as Gnostics. Our, our psychology is, is based on the, on the cosmology and, and on the, the fall of Sophia and on the threefold nature of creation. Our, our, and, and so is our redemption, our soteriology and our, and our eschatology are all, all come from our cosmology. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's why, um, you know, we hear from a lot of, you know, contemporary folks that, well, you know, Gnostics didn't believe in dogma. 
or, or doctrine or didn't think doctrine was very important. You know, they've got a book called The Authoritative Teaching. Right, right. You know, the reality of the rulers. Mm -hmm. um, these, these things weren't, weren't just somewhat important. They were essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and dogma wasn't a four-letter word for them. You know, as we've, we've talked about it on various venues, but the, the need to have a dogma is, you know, foundational for any religious tradition, um, even for what they call, you know, secular humanism. That contains a whole set of dogmas as well. Right. You know, it's just a different one that doesn't involve God, right? You know. Well, and it, it's all, you know, the question is never dogma or, or no dogma because every... Well, I think for some people that is the question. Well, some people will phrase the question that way, sure. And what they have is unacknowledged dogma. Mm. Um, um, usually based upon dogmatic relativism, which they right. would be very absolutist about. <laughs> And um, you know, the question isn't really no dogma. I mean, for me, isn't dogma or no dogma? It's what role does dogma play? Mm -hmm. Dogma can be the, you know, dogmatism can be a dead end road mm -hmm. where people just point at the, the letter of the word. They get caught up in the finger pointing at the moon instead of the moon. Um, that's where dogma, but, but dogma shapes the way that we pray. It shapes the way that we understand our spiritual path. And, and seeing that, that way, and in the context of genuine, actual, regular spiritual practice, there's a feedback loop between mm -hmm. our praxis and our intellectual understanding mm -hmm. that is part of the development of Gnosis. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to get back to, to cosmology just for a minute here. Uh, now, your church has a pretty specific cosmology based on Valentinian, Duanel, kind of Yeah, yeah, uh, explicitly Valentinian mm -hmm. as as interpreted by Duanel. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you, you know, the, 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 the different schools of Valentinism always, you know, had their differences and their nuances. And the uh, the Restoration Church of Duanel was no different. Um, it incorporated some ideas from Simon Magus and as well as uh, the idea of the, of the Third Age, mm -hmm. the the age of the, of the Numa Agi and the Divine Feminine as well. Um, and having having the having clarity on that, um, I think, really allows the development of um, liturgical and spiritual practices um, that are consistent with that worldview. Mm -hmm. So, for you, the cosmology has a very practical significance, in addition to being educational. Oh yeah, yeah. If, if if it wasn't if it wasn't practical, I wouldn't have any interest in it at all. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it's it, it, but a line can be drawn from directly from um, the worldview, the cosmological worldview, to the way we say the liturgy, or the or or the, the way that we deliberately approach spiritual practices, the ends that we have and the means that we use, and otherwise, you know, it would just be sort of an interesting historical thing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to our, our next question here. Um, this one we got a few weeks ago. Why does why does do the modern Gnostic churches look so Catholic when, you know, or mainstream Christian when a lot of the early Gnostics were um, stomped out by those same people? You know, why do we use the same texts, a lot of the same texts? So what's, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think, look, you know, if we look back to... Um, to what we know of the Gnostic communities. They all had in their own ways a very rich sacramental life. Mm -hmm. um, there seemed to have been substantial differences between, say, different schools of Sethianism and, and the ways that Valentinians would have approached it. But they, but the, the Valentinians, for instance, um, practiced baptism, um, confirmation, or chrismation. Um, they celebrated the Eucharist. Um, and then they had their own, um, possibly their own sacraments in addition to those, the, uh, the apolytrosis, um, performed, by, performed by priests. Mm -hmm. And we know um, that they fully participated in the regular life of the church. There's a tendency among, uh, again, among contemporary Gnostics, and a lot of this has to do maybe with our background and also has to do with the spiritual climate of the day, there's a tendency to define Gnosticism um, purely in terms of rebellion against the established order. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so if you're really a Gnostic, then you don't do any churchy stuff. Um, you don't do any sacraments, any rituals, and it's all sort of about, you know, freaking out the squares. <laughs> and, and you just don't get that sense when you read the text. Um, and, you know, the, the Valentinians, for instance, and we could talk about the Sethians as well, but the Valentinians consider themselves part of the, the, the great church, the broader church, mm -hmm. and, and, and felt an obligation of service and communion with the greater church. And, and so I know, you know, um, you know, speaking for me and, and the community I serve, we don't consider ourselves in opposition mm -hmm. to, um, to the rest of Christianity. We consider ourselves a branch of the, of the church. Yeah. And, you know, and frankly, wearing a collar, wearing um, the regalia, um, it has tremendous symbolic value um, with 2,000 years of tradition behind mm -hmm. it. And like all human traditions, there are um, failings and tragedies and tre tremendous errors and wrongdoing associated with this. But if we focus on that, we'll, we'll miss what else is there. I mean, this is this tremendous power um, on symbolism and, and um, a dynamic living faith that's, that's included just, you know, uh, think of the great saints of the, of the mainstream apostolic churches, people like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Seraphim of Sarav, uh, Theoclete um, from the Joanite tradition, yeah. um, and, and the great saints and mystics of the church, uh, Hildegard of Bingen, I mean, St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Lisieux. Um, you know, do we need to define ourselves in opposition to those people, or can we say that we'll embrace them as fellow Christians, mm -hmm. and without necessarily um, owning everything that, that the baggage and all that comes with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I often find myself, especially in Gnostic circles, um, being the guy who defends the mainstream churches, because you always hear it, um, especially with people who are relatively new to Gnosticism, well, that's not actually true. It, it, a lot of Gnostics, regardless of how long they've been around Gnosticism, just have a knee-jerk reaction to the church, the, the mainstream church. And yeah. well, know, on it, a certain that level, that's understandable. And part of it is that they've they learned their history from, yeah. from Dan Brown well. <laughs> instead of from actual academic sources. Right. And, and, you know... Um, Dan Brown just frankly made up a lot of his story. True. And even the stuff that he presents as being factual stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when he says the Council of Nicaea established Christianity as the official state religion and threw the Gnostics out and established the Bible and got rid of the Gnostic Gospels, well, not a single one of those things is actually historically true. Right. But you'll hear it, you'll hear it every day. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and the the fact that the the mainstream church doesn't talk about Gnosis or Gnosticism, it's still there if you know where to look. Sure. Um, I think the reason why I'm a Gnostic specifically and not a Roman Catholic is because I wanted to belong to a tradition where you don't have to work very hard to get to that stuff. Whereas I think you'd, you know, everybody could point to Teresa of Avila and say that that was a Gnostic experience. You know, that she had an experience of the divine and the church embraced that, right. you know. Right. Uh, maybe not right at the moment, but they did eventually come to embrace that. And uh, and so the the gnosis is there, and it's always there. It's there in all of the wealth of human tradition from, you know, the very first humans that climbed out of the trees on down. That yeah. It's, but the reason why we're Gnostic is because we want to bring that to the forefront. I think that's yeah. you know that's a lot of the reasons why we like the traditions that come with the you know the historical church, but we have uh, you know other things that we also like as well. <laughs> it's kind of a cop out answer, but I think that's part of well. I, I I think it's marrying a sacramental the a, a sacramental uh, liturgical apostolic approach to a a more open like you said a a, a more open quest for gnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, which is always there, mm -hmm. and and that's where our focus should be is on the quest for gnosis, not on. Um, it has a tendency to uh, you know define ourselves in terms of what we're not. Right. 
you know, we're not like those people, we're not like those people, we're not like the fundamentalists, or we're not like the Catholics. And that will only carry you so far. Uh, it's one of the inherent problems of Protestantism, um, the theology of protest. Mm -hmm. um, at, at some point you have to affirm what you're for, and you have to outline a path that's, that's, that's positive and and outline something that's bigger than just, well, we're not like those people. Right, right. Okay, let's move on to our last question here. I think we can get through this one relatively quickly. So, Scripture, is it divinely inspired or just written by some dead guys? Absolutely. Okay, good answer. So, uh, we were talking earlier about the letter of Ptolemy to Flora, right? Um, the, specifically talking about the Old Testament, right? Right, which is the only thing they would have known of as right. Scripture right. In, in, in that day. Yeah, um, the view outlined there was sort of, well, part of it was written by Moses, the man. And and that's why in the New Testament, Jesus says, Moses told you this, but I'm telling you this. So there was an acknowledgement that, sure, part of this was just, um, was written by a guy. Who, and, um, and then part of it was the work of the Demiurge, who was uh, in, in this system, the lawgiver, mm -hmm. the, the administrator. Um, One of the reasons why early Gnostics got accused of being anti-Semitic an awful lot. Right. And then, and, but there's also an acknowledgement that the, uh, that Sophia Akhmud spoke through um, the prophets. So, um, even, in the, even in Scripture, in the Old Testament, you still have this threefold division. You have a, something that was purely, you know, man-created, um, something that was demiurgical, mm -hmm. and and then something that was pneumatic. And uh, to discern those things requires that we engage Scripture in a serious way, in a serious contemplative way, mm -hmm. and and begin to use what's in Scripture. So you, didn't, so you mean there's no version of the Old Testament that's written in three different colors? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, if it was easy, I mean, you, you know, I mean, there are a lot of easy alternatives. There's, there's fundamentalism, which... Um, you know, takes it all as, you know, a guy who sort of dictated this stuff. It's mm -hmm. a channel, the document. And then there's um, the other extreme, uh, liberal theology, secular humanist approach to scripture, which just says, oh, well, it's all just man-made, you know, we can study this history and literature, but, you know, let's not, let's not take it too seriously. And then there's, a, you know, and then there's an approach that integrates it with practice, and, uh, which doesn't provide for a soundbite answer. Right. And so often with Gnosticism, that is not the case. Right. Yeah. And it requires us to do real work to engage the scriptures mm -hmm. and, and to see what parts of it. Um, and, and as we do, we'll see, we'll, we'll see meaning, you know, come alive in the scriptures for us. And, of course, we'll see a lot of things that, well, maybe on the surface don't seem like a good idea. And we can yeah. you know, shelve those and come back to them later. Yep. It's a process. Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you can see, we talked about this the last couple of episodes, but uh, this all these all have come from the viewers. So if you have any questions or comments you'd like to uh, get, get in touch with us, you can comment on the YouTube video. Uh, please do. Any questions are welcome. Any comments are welcome. You can also email us, talknosis at gnosticnyc.com, and the show notes and social media links will be in the description. This time I'll remember, I promise. Um, so upcoming on Talk Gnosis, uh, I know we talked last time about having Tao Allen Greenfield on this show, but there was a conflict. Um, we're almost 100% certain that he will be with us next yes, week, yes, next week. Uh, December 1st, and he will be discussing his uh, new book, Christ and the Master Therion. Coming up at Gnostic NYC, uh, December 8th, we're going to have a Centering Prayer Workshop that's at uh, CRS in Manhattan. Um, December 16th, a lecture on... Paulicians, Cathars, and Bogomils, oh my, uh, which will talk about kind of the, the middle Gnostics, um, which I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing. Now. That, that'll be very interesting. If you have any questions or comments for the upcoming lecture, please send them to info at GnosticNYC.com and see GnosticNYC.com for all the details for this and all upcoming Gnostic NYC programs. If you are interested in helping to support our program, please visit our website. Down on the left-hand side of the page is a blue button that says support us. All donations are tax-deductible and are greatly appreciated. And Talk Gnosis is a production of Gnostic NYC, promoting Gnosticism in New York City. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends, click the like button, and subscribe to our channel. 
Opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent the views of Gnostic NYC or of any other organization. No animals were harmed during the production of this show. For more talk gnosis, tune in live every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Good night.